Christmas is always here. Ah, yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. yes. It rotates every month. Oh, have every month. Yeah. Okay. Good morning. We, the Security Council members that have joined the joint pledges on climate, peace, and security, France, Guyana, Japan, Mozambique, the Republic of Korea, Sierra Leone, Slovenia, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, the United States, and my own country, Malta, have come together to express deep concern on the climate security challenges facing Yemen ahead of today's Security Council briefing. In Yemen, the interlinkages between climate change, peace, and security are evident through ongoing environmental degradation, socioeconomic vulnerabilities, and conflict. Environmental stress factors aggravate food and water insecurity. The widespread destruction of infrastructure and the displacement of communities. The ongoing conflict has further exacerbated these challenges and highlighted vulnerabilities among the Yemeni population. Increasing strains on the capacity of local authorities and humanitarian organizations to respond effectively. Yemen is one of the most water-stressed countries in the world. It faces increased temperatures, erratic rainfall patterns, flash floods, as well as drought and desertification, exacerbated by the El Niño phenomenon. Depleting groundwater reserves have negatively impacted agricultural lands and pose significant threats to food security and livelihoods. Despite these adversities, the resilience of the Yemeni people to strive and adapt in the face of such challenges is recognized. In rural communities, women are frequently dependent upon natural and agricultural resources for their livelihoods and to sustain their families. They play a pivotal role in food security and in mitigating tensions over natural resources, including resolving water and land disputes. We highlight the work of Yemeni women-led civil society organizations in this respect, especially in remote and frontline areas. Addressing such challenges in Yemen demands our immediate attention. We should strengthen our efforts to end conflict and insecurity in Yemen and enhance community resilience amongst the complex socioeconomic and political landscape. A coordinated approach is needed to address climate stresses, impacts on biodiversity, and the protracted conflicts that has created a vicious cycle of instability. Such an approach should be complemented by measures that promote peace building while addressing the impacts of climate change and protect protecting biodiversity. The Security Council must meet its responsibilities of maintaining international peace and security by recognizing the nexus with climate change and addressing the full range of conflict risk factors. We stress the importance of dialogue, international cooperation and support, which are key in fostering peace, stability and resilience building in Yemen. We also call for comprehensive climate-related peace security risk assessments and for strengthened disaster risk management, including early warning systems. In overcoming such challenges, we must continue to ensure immediate humanitarian assistance that addresses the urgent needs of the population, particularly women, children, young persons, older persons, minorities, and internally displaced persons, including through providing access to clean water and sanitation, food aid, shelter, and healthcare services. The international community should also continue to promote sustainable and integrated resource management practices, implementing innovative agricultural techniques, enhancing water conservation measures and maritime security, and investing in clean and renewable energy sources. As pledge holders and as council members committed to advancing the climate, peace and security agenda, 
it remains our priority to effectively develop evidence-based and holistic strategies that address the interconnected challenges and of conflict and climate change. Only through concerted and sustained action, fostering national and local ownership, can meaningful progress be made towards building a more sustainable, resilient and secure future for the people of Yemen. Thank you. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provision and Rules of Procedure, I invite the representative of Yemen to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provision and Rules of Procedure, I invite the following briefers to participate in this meeting. Mr. Hans Grunberg, Special Envoy of the Secretary General for Yemen. Ms. Edem Vosurno, Director of Operations and Advocacy, Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, and Ms. Wamdeh Shakir, Founder and Chairwoman, ITAR Foundation for Social Development. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I now give the floor to Ms. Hans Grunberg. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, allow me to, to start by wishing Yemenis and uh, Muslims around the world Aid Mubarak. Needless to say, we meet at a particularly dangerous moment in the Middle East. The need for broader regional de-escalation is acute. I share the Secretary General's alarm about the very real danger of region-wide escalation and his urging to all parties for maximum restraints. Sustained and enduring efforts towards fostering peaceful and stable relations are imperative for the well-being of the populations in the Middle East. This has long been evident in the case of Yemen and is a rightful demand that the Yemeni people deserve. We also meet just as the holy month of Ramadan has come to an end. In previous years, Ramadan provided an opportunity for the Yemeni parties to overcome differences, reinforce hope, and build confidence. Two years ago, the parties agreed to a much welcomed nationwide truce, which has ever since provided relative calm along the Yemeni front lines. And last year, over 900 detainees were released, allowing them to spend the Eid reunited with their families and loved ones. Regrettably, this year has not witnessed such scenes of celebration. The Detainees we had hoped would be released in time to spend Eid with their loved ones remain in detention. Roads we had hoped to see open remain closed. We also witnessed the tragic killing and injury of 16 civilians, including women and children, when a residence was demolished by Ansarallah individuals in al Baida governorate. Instead of narrowing differences and building confidence, Madam President, I am troubled by the apparent growing divergence between the parties. On the economic front, the parties are engaging in unilateral actions that risk further bifurcating the economic system. The disintegration of the currency in circulation in Ansarallah controlled areas presents a real economic problem for the Yemeni people. But reaching a solution is being severely complicated by the contested authority of the Central Bank of Yemen. The challenges facing the Yemeni economy require rather a strategic and coordinated response in line with the long term settlement of the conflict. While the countrywide military situation remains contained in comparison to the situation before April 2022, we have recently seen an escalation of hostilities on several front lines, particularly in Al-Dale and Lahaj. 
troop movements, intermittent fighting, and, and exchanges of fire have also been reported in Hodeida, Marib, Sada, Shabwa, and Taiz governorates. Madam President, what Yemenis ultimately need is a nationwide ceasefire, improved living conditions, and the resumption of an inclusive political process that meaningfully engages a wide variety of voices, including women, youth, civil society, and marginalized groups. My mediation approach has been focused on delivering exactly that. Last December, the parties took an important step by articulating to me their, read their readiness to operationalize a set of commitments through a United Nations roadmap. Unfortunately, momentum towards an agreement was stalled by regional events, which have significantly complicated the mediation space. The escalation in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden having entered its sixth month, has continued with Ansarallah targeting commercial and military vessels, and the United States and the United Kingdom carrying out attacks on military targets in Hodeida, Hajjaj, Sana'a, and Taiz. In the absence of a ceasefire in Gaza and a complete termination of attacks in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden, the threat of further escalation persists. The recent developments involving Iran and Israel underscore the urgency of this matter. The region must, with the support of the international community, seek avenues for coexistence based on incremental trust building, mutual security, and a departure from the zero-sum mentality of achieving victory at the expense of others. Madam President, while the conflicts in Yemen and the wider region have become undeniably interlinked, I strongly believe that we owe it to the Yemenis to ensure that resolving the conflict in Yemen is not made contingent upon the resolution of other issues. We cannot risk Yemen's chance for peace becoming a collateral damage. Yemeni people, including the 17 million that remain dependent on humanitarian aid and for their survival, have suffered for too long already. Peace in Yemen has intrinsic value, and I'm convinced that uh, Yemen at peace with itself and its neighbors would have a positive impact on the regional dynamics. If we leave Yemen's political process in the waiting room and continue down this path of escalation, the consequences could be catastrophic, not only for Yemen, but also for the wider region. Engagement with the parties on the roadmap and its elements can help to open space for dialogue. I therefore continue to be in close touch with all sides to build confidence and find, find solutions. My office will continue to encourage and help the parties with the opening of roads, resolving difficult economic differences, making progress on the roadmap and preparing for its impl implementation. We will also continue our work on the release of the detainees. And in the meantime, I call on the parties to refrain from unilateral escalatory measures and engage in good faith dialogue under the auspices of the United Nations to find common solutions through collaboration and to turn disputes into opportunities to take the path towards common prosperity. Madam President, in my recent visits to Washington, Riyadh, Muscat and Moscow, I underlined the need for de-escalation in the Red Sea and to remain focused on the long-term objectives for Yemen, namely an intra-Yemeni political process that results in a sustainable and just peace, addresses human suffering and allows for reconstruction and economic prosperity. I was pleased to hear that across the board, my interlocutors continue to remain united in their support for these objectives. I will depend on this support and the support of this council in the months ahead. Thank you, Madam President. I thank Mr. Grunberg for his briefing. I now give the floor to Ms. Eden Vosurno. Thank you, Madam President. And allow me to thank Special Envoy Grunberg for his uh, continued tireless efforts to help the people of Yemen reach a lasting peace and for his update. This month marks two years since the United Nations brokered truce was announced, which provided precious relief for the humanitarian situation long past its expiry lower numbers of civilian casualties, eased trade restrictions, and increased imports of essential items, increased road and air connections, and some displaced people have been able to return to their homes. 
The crisis in and near the Red Sea continues to threaten progress and stability. For now, we are thankful that we have still not seen major implications for the humanitarian situation. As is well known, the main causes of large-scale needs in Yemen, in particular, the deteriorating economy, barely functioning public services, and protracted conflict-induced displacement are yet to be addressed. Public services and institutions continue to degrade and economic indicators remain worrisome. The re-emergence of cholera and growing levels of severe malnutrition are telling indicators of the weakened capacity of social services. Almost one in every two children under five are stunted. More than double the global average, 49% compared to 21.3%. The most vulnerable people, including women and girls, marginalized, marginalized groups such as the Mohammedan, internally displaced people, migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees, and persons with disabilities still depend on humanitarian assistance to survive. And as we have often briefed the council, humanitarians continue to operate in a very difficult environment. From December last year to February this year, aid agencies reported 137 access constraints. The majority were interference in humanitarian programming and movement restrictions in areas controlled by the Houthi de facto authorities, in particular for Yemeni women aid workers. I saw the impacts of these restrictions firsthand when I visited Yemen in March. Intergovernorate movements of our Yemeni female colleagues were denied in Houthi controlled areas in the absence of a male guardian, limiting our engagement with women and girls. In areas controlled by the government of Yemen, insecurity and fragmented administrative requirements, including the approval of sub-agreements, continue to delay our response. And lastly, we continue to struggle with a concerning deficit in funding for the 2024 humanitarian appeal. Despite extensive work by the humanitarian community to prioritize the response, and reduce the appeal from $4.3 billion in 2023 to $2.7 billion in 2024. The appeal is only 10% funded as we enter the second quarter of the year. Madam President, members of the Council, as we have previously briefed, the Council, the humanitarian community in Yemen, is transforming our response to adapt to the shifting realities in Yemen. This transformation is taking place in different ways. Please allow me to outline a few. We are promoting a locally driven response and more sustainable solutions for the people of Yemen in close collaboration with our development partners and affected communities. We are reviewing the way we operate in Yemen to ensure we remain fit for purpose and able to meet emerging challenges. We are working to further improve targeting to better direct assistance to those in need. The United Nations World Food Program's ongoing retargeting efforts, which I will discuss in more detail shortly, are indeed a critical first step. We are doubling, redoubling our efforts to ensure a principled and measured approach to humanitarian action and expand operational space and actively advocating against politicization of our work. And we are pursuing more structured engagement with all parties and seeking systematic, systemic solutions to persisting challenges. Madam President, I would like to provide more detail about two particular issues that are most urgent to the humanitarian community today. One of them is cholera, and the other is food and nutrition uh, insecurity. Since October last year, we have been seeing an alarming resurgence of cholera across the country. The last outbreak was in 2019. The response in government controlled areas led by the government with the support of the humanitarian community has slowed the spread of the disease and ensured the availability of treatment for people affected. This work 
was boosted by a Yemen humanitarian fund allocation in November and generous donor support for the outbreak response. However, since March, we have seen the outbreak spread rapidly in areas controlled by the Houthi de facto authorities. As of 7 April, more than 11,000 suspected cases have been reported in these areas with 75 associated deaths, compared with approximately 3,200 suspected cases in government controlled areas also since October. As shown by the success in curbing the outbreak in government controlled areas, a rapid response is absolutely critical. The United Nations and our humanitarian partners are working closely with relevant authorities to scale up the response. However, emergency stocks of supplies, essential supplies, are almost depleted. Water and sanitation and hygiene support systems need urgent strengthening. We appeal to the international community to help us to fill these urgent gaps, including, of course, with critical funding and supplies. Madam President, we have repeatedly voiced our strong concerns about food and nutrition insecurity in Yemen this year. Ramadan and Eid festivities have seen some small temporary but welcome relief with zakat, Islamic charity obligations, remittances and community-led mechanisms, providing more people with access to essential items and the ability to purchase food in the markets. We expect food and nutrition security to worsen though, further as the lean season begins in the coming weeks. Our efforts to address the situation continue apace. The World Food Programme's pilot retargeting exercise is now underway in Houthi controlled areas, and we expect to see positive results by the end of the month. Until food assistance starts flowing, the humanitarian country team and its partners are doing what they can to mitigate the most severe impacts of the pause in general food distribution and protect the most vulnerable. Nutrition interventions will be scaled up in 34 districts assessed to be the worst affected with the support of a $6 million allocation from the Yemen Humanitarian Fund. NGOs will dis distribute pre-positioned nutrition supplies in these districts. The needs, however, remain tremendous and the United Nations and its partners require significantly more to keep hunger at bay. Madam President, distinguished members of the Council, Yemen needs three things today. One, we must keep front of mind how easily progress achieved since the start, since the truce could be lost, and how much more there is to do in a complex operating environment. I urge the Security Council to redouble its efforts to secure lasting peace and stability in Yemen. Two, with food and malnutrition rates rising and the cholera outbreak quickly worsening, we must be able to act quickly to minimize suffering and prevent further deterioration of conditions. The active united support of council members is critical, crucial to create an enabling environment to help us carry out this work. And finally, I urge council members to do what they can to provide urgently needed funding to aid the program in Yemen, to ensure the well-being of millions of Yemeni and support the steps the humanitarian community is taking to improve the effectiveness of our response. In closing, allow me also to warmly wish Eid Mubarak to all those who celebrate in Yemen and around the world today. I thank you. I thank Ms. Wasserna for her briefing. I now give the floor to Ms. Wamid Shakir. Madam President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Wamid Shakir and I am the chairwoman of the Itar Foundation for Social Development. It's a Yemeni organization 
dedicated to promoting the rights and participation of women and youth, building peace and achieving social and gender equality in the Yemeni civil society. I stand before you today with a heavy heart, pleading for your attention to the ongoing crisis in Yemen that has unfolded for so long because of the war, causing great devastation to many Yemenis, particularly women, girls, and children. I would like to focus on three main points today. First, the gendered impact of the humanitarian and economic crisis and its impact on children as well. Second, the impacts of climate change, particularly on women, girls, and boys. And third, the role of civil society, including women's rights and women-led organizations, and the importance of their full, equal, and meaningful participation in the peace and political process. Madam President, the conflict in Yemen has unleashed a devastating humanitarian crisis, leaving 17 million Yemenis suffering from food insecurity, while 6 million are on the precipice of famine. Women and children are bearing the brunt of this crisis as they comprise almost 80% of those in need of humanitarian assistance. In the meantime, the value of the currency has dropped, thus causing food prices to increase by over 300% and 400% for wheat alone. Today, more than half of households in Yemen cannot afford daily necessities. Matters are made worse because of power outages, water scarcity, and unpaid wages. The economic collapse disproportionately burdens Yemeni women. Soaring food prices and dwindling resources are forcing women to skip meals or sell their belongings. Malnutrition threatens over 2.7 million pregnant and breastfeeding women. The stalled peace talks and the ongoing fighting are further worsening the situation. Women are being excluded from decision-making, despite the fact that they bear the brunt of the conflict. Yet, they still have no voice in ending it. Skipping meals, children dropping out of school, child marriage, child labor, and begging on the streets are some of the high-risk coping strategies that millions in Yemen have had to resort to, to survive. Millions of girls have had to drop out of school to work and provide food for their families. Out of 10.7 million school-aged children in Yemen, 4.5 million children are out of school, 70% of whom are girls. Displaced children are twice as likely to drop out than their peers. The lack of access to education for girls has raised the rates of forced early child marriage, particularly for displaced girls, where one out of five displaced girls is currently married between the ages of 10 and 19, which is a significantly higher number than the typical marriage age in the host community. Urgent funding is crucial in preventing a humanitarian catastrophe in Yemen. Donors must support local civil society, especially women's rights groups, with long-term funding. This empowers local leaders to reach the most vulnerable. Madam President, climate change adds a, another layer of devastation to the humanitarian catastrophe. Yemen's vulnerability to climate change translates into food insecurity, water scarcity, and displacement, erratic rainfall patterns, rising temperatures, and declining groundwater levels threaten food security for millions who rely on agriculture for their livelihoods. A third of Yemen's groundwater and surface water is on the verge of depletion. Water wells are reaching depths of over 700 meters all of this disproportionately affects women and girls who play a crucial role in food production and household water collection and management. Moreover, 
women own less than 1% of farming land and thus water, and this hinders their ability to adapt to climate change and access resources. In 2023, Climate change affected over 300,000 people in Yemen, most of whom are IDPs who had fled conflict areas and then lost their shelters, income, and any form of livelihood. This is what climate change does in Yemen in light of the current crisis. It exacerbates displacement. It forces millions to flee their homes in search of water, food, and safety. 4.5 million Yemenis are internally displaced due to natural disasters. Women and girls are affected more than others by climate change, violence, and disease. At the Itar Foundation, we have recently worked with 460 internally displaced women who informed us that sewage overflow, swamps, heavy rainfall, flooding, and industrial pollution, especially from oil companies, are the most frequent issues and problems in the areas, communities, especially women, are forced to adopt negative coping mechanisms to survive, such as reducing spending on health needs, being forcibly displaced to safer places, and resorting to borrowing. These women said that their three highest aspirations were shelter, more sustainable services, and a lasting peace. Despite the devastating effects, authorities do not consider climate change a priority. Mitigating the effects of climate change requires long-term development programs. It requires abundant funding and specialized expertise, all of which are almost entirely absent and impossible to achieve in the shadow of the conflict and political fragility of the country. Although existing climate change adaptation plans do recognize the need for civil society and local community engagement, they lack gender and youth responsive implementation mechanisms. It is imperative that policies, strategies, and projects to address climate change reflect the needs, expertise, and aspirations of women and girls. Madam President, women play a critical role in peace building and social cohesion, yet their voices are missing from the decision-making table. The negotiating parties have a dismal record when it comes to women's inclusion. Alarmingly, the representation of women is declining at all levels and their participation in the peace process remains negligible. Women are underrepresented in the political entities of the government and political parties, as well as those engaged in the conflict at regional and global levels. Women's leadership within civil society organizations is also law, low and they face difficulties in accessing funding and capacity building. Civil society, especially women's rights and women-led organizations are the backbone of Yemeni humanitarian peace and development efforts. They provide essential humanitarian assistance. They advocate for just and inclusive peace and empower women and youth. However, their space is shrinking by the day. The ongoing conflict and restrictions of movement and the sharp decline in funding further undermine their crucial contributions. Therefore, it is crucial to prioritize gender equality and local women's leadership in humanitarian development and peace-building efforts. Madam President, Yemeni men and women desperately need a lasting peace that protects their human rights. Renewed efforts towards peace-building are crucial with civil society and women's rights organizations at the forefront. This can pave the way for a secure future for all Yemenis. Therefore, I urge the Security Council to do the following. Call on all parties to respect and protect the human rights of all Yemeni men and women in accordance with international law. Hold United Nations member states to account for upholding principles and rights-based frameworks around women, peace and security, and youth peace and security, contributing to inclusive peace processes that guarantee the full, equal, and meaningful participation of all Yemenis, including women and youth. Urge donors to fund the humanitarian response plan urgently and fully in Yemen with direct, flexible, and multi-year funding 
to women's rights and women-led organizations urge all parties to the conflict to take concrete steps to address the ongoing economic crisis, alleviate poverty, and preserve the dignity of the Yemeni people. Urge the parties in Yemen to lift all restrictions on the movement of Yemeni women and female workers in humanitarian and peace building areas. This includes facilitating the work of local and international organizations. Urge all parties to the conflict in Yemen to address the climate crisis, including by enhancing good governance, building institutional capacity, and empowering civil society participation. I thank you. I thank Ms. Shaki for her briefing. I now give the floor to the, those council members who wish to make statements. I give the floor to the representative of United Kingdom. Thank you, President. And let me start by thanking Special Envoy Grunberg and Director Wasunu for your briefings. And I'm also grateful to Ms. Shakir for highlighting the connections between climate, peace and security, as well as the stark humanitarian situation. Uh, as you said, and we've heard, Yemen faces stark environmental challenges on top of the ongoing conflict. And addressing these environmental challenges now as part of any discussion for peace will be critical to Yemen's future sustainability. We also share Director Wosonu and Ms. Shakir's concerns about the humanitarian situation in Yemen, and in particular, the access constraints preventing women aid workers uh, from delivering vital assistance. We reiterate our call for all parties to facilitate unhindered access for humanitarian workers and welcome OCHA's proposals for adaptive measures, which Ms. Ms. Wasonu has just outlined. The UK has given over $1.2 billion in humanitarian aid since the crisis start, started. We gave $110 million last year, and we expect to increase our contribution uh, this year. We also continue to support fully the ongoing efforts of the Special Envoy Hans Grunberg to progress a roadmap towards UN-led Yemeni Yemeni dialogue. As we've said before, an inclusive political settlement is the only way to bring sustainable peace and long-term stability to Yemen and address the worsening humanitarian crisis. President, we unequivocally condemn the Iranian strikes against Israel over the weekend, which have done nothing to advance prospects for peace in Gaza. The UK has long been clear about Iran's unacceptable role in destabilizing the region, including their role in supporting the Houthis in Yemen. We understand the Houthis contributed to this latest attack. Their reckless actions continue to risk seriously undermining efforts to bring peace to the Yemeni people. The Houthis continue to risk further escalation with their ongoing attacks against shipping in the Red Sea. This council has been clear. In its adoption of UNSCR 2722 on the 10th of January, that we condemn Houthi attacks. They threaten innocent lives, endanger aid delivery to Yemen and the region. We also reaffirm our condemnation of the attack on a home in Radar last month by the Houthis. This attack led to a tragic loss of life and injury and we express our deepest condolences to the families of those killed and injured. Furthermore, the decision to issue counterfeit currency in Yemen threatens to destabilize the banking sector and deepen division in the country's already fragile economy. Finally, President, we call on the Houthis to prioritize the interests of the Yemeni people, to engage with UN efforts to resolve economic fragmentation and to cease provocations in order to preserve space for an intra-Yemeni peace process. In short, we call on the Houthis to stop attacks and to return to the peace talks. Thank you, President. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom and I give the floor to the representative of Sierra Leone. Madam President, I have the honor to deliver this statement on behalf of the eight three plus members, namely Algeria, Guyana, Mozambique, and my country, Sierra Leone. 
We thank Special Envoy Hans Kuhnberg and Director Idem Wosono for their briefings. We also thank Ms. Wamne Sakir for the information provided. The A3 plus reiterated support for the resumption of a Yemeni-led and Yemeni-owned peace process based on the agreed references for political settlement. The attainment of an inclusive nationwide ceasefire is thus an imperative for the peace process to thrive. This is a priority that must be pursued. In this vein, sustained initiatives and the mutual exchange of prisoners, for instance, can rekindle efforts to build confidence and leverage the parties to honor their commitment to the peace process. We are of the view that the Special Envoy's vision for a bottom-up approach in canvassing much-needed support for the relevant, from the relevant stakeholders will serve as a linchpin in the mediation efforts. <coughs> the facilitating role of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Sultanate of Oman, and the active involvement of the parties, civil society, women's group, and the youth are crucial to achieving this aspiration. We call on the parties not to allow the escalating situation in the Red Sea to deviate attention from effectively implementing the peace process. We urge the Houthis to resume their engagement and to participate constructively in the ongoing efforts led by the Special Envoy and other regional and international initiatives to successfully implement the peace process. Concrete gains made by the government and the Houthis, such as the opening of roads and the ties governate are key to cementing future collaborations. Furthermore, we call on the Houthis to refrain from any measures that may negatively impact economic activities in Yemen, and for them to provide assurances that allow traders the freedom to import commodities to all Yemeni ports. Facilitating free movement of goods will significantly contribute to mitigate the humanitarian crisis and allow the government to adequately fulfill its duties for the benefit of all Yemeni people, including through the payment of salaries. <clears throat> Madam President, Yemen is faced with a dire humanitarian situation with increased food insecurity and malnutrition. In government controlled areas, the number of people receiving aid and the size of food rations have reduced. However, humanitarian needs remain widespread. According to the World Food Program, 18.6 million Yemenis would need humanitarian assistance in 2024, and 17 million people are food insecure. The WFP estimates that it will need 2.9 billion in 2024 to meet those needs. We therefore welcome the CRF allocation of 7 million last month to bridge the WFP funding gap and tackle urgent food security and malnutrition challenges in Yemen. The A3 Plus therefore calls on the international community, the non-traditional donors such as philanthropic organizations to scale up funding to support the effort of the WFP to cover the remaining 100 million funding gap so that the organization could resume and sustain food distribution across Yemen. We also call for the establishment of sustainable financing programs that will stimulate economic growth and support small and medium-sized enterprises including through enhanced support for women-owned businesses and facilitate trade between the North and South, such as women-led microcredit schemes. Madam President, the A3 plus members are appalled by the attack against civilians and the destruction of residential homes in Rada in the Al-Bayada governorate <laughs> during the early month of Ramadan that resulted in 12 deaths and 35 injuries. The A3 plus calls for the cessation of the Houthis' military attack in different areas in Yemen, including the attacks on commercial and merchant vessels in the Red Sea and the Gulf of, Gulf of Aden. The A3 plus further calls for assurances for the safety of ships that are carrying humanitarian aid and foodstuffs to Yemen ports to alleviate the humanitarian crisis faced by the people of Yemen. The A3 plus stresses the need to address the root causes of the conflict and calls all concerned actors to exercise maximum restraint and for them to prioritize political and diplomatic means over military options to resolve the conflict to ensure lasting peace in Yemen and the region. In conclusion, Madam President, it is imperative to avoid a regional spillover of the Gaza conflict and to de-escalate tensions in the wider region of the Middle East, including in Yemen. 
we call on all relevant stakeholders to build on efforts for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. The people of Yemen deserve a united country that is in peace and thriving economically. I thank you. I thank the representative of Sierra Leone and I give the floor to the representative of Slovenia. Thank you very much, President. Uh, thank you and thanks also to uh, today's briefers, Special Envoy Grunberg, Executive Director of Osorno, and Ms. Shakir. Um, I also know the presence of the Yemeni ambassador today with us. President, I begin by once again stating Slovenia's commitment to long-term peace in Yemen and our support to the ongoing UN efforts to that end. <coughs> the vision of the Special Envoy for the ceasefire and the roadmap leading to an inclusive political process in Yemen is the best possible chance for achieving peace after nine long years of war. We must not lose sight of the ultimate aim. We call on all parties to engage constructively with the special envoys and to prioritize de-escalation and dialogue at a very fragile time for Yemen and the region in the turmoil of the catastrophe unfolding in Gaza. We reiterate our support to the internationally recognized government of Yemen and congratulate His Excellency Zindani on his appointment as Foreign Minister. We furthermore emphasize the importance of an effective and united Presidential Leadership Council. All parties must actively prepare for an intra-Yemeni political process, which we hope can commence in the very near future. The process in which women will fully, equally and meaningfully participate. And we once again clearly call for the immediate cessation of Houthi's attack, which have continued in the Red Sea and which undermine peace efforts as it demanded in Resolution 2722. <laughs> the attacks reported against civilian homes in Al Bayara governor, Governorate in recent weeks are also deeply shocking and should fully be investigated. President, we have heard today that humanitarian needs in Yemen remain alarmingly high. While Ramadan brought some respite, food insecurity and malnutrition have surged in recent months, posing a real threat to the lives and well-being of millions of Yemenis, particularly women and children. Ensuring that humanitarian aid is available and accessible is the foremost priority. We welcome the commencing of a pilot targeting exercise by the World Food Program and hope that it will be possible to resume broader food distribution soon. We reiterate our strong support to the work of OCHA and agencies on the ground, as well as for UNVIM, which is crucial in ensuring Yemenis have access to the food they so desperately need. Meeting Yemen's humanitarian needs is a necessary, necessary first step that has to be followed by long-term sustainable solutions underpinned by lasting peace. President, <coughs> our civil society briefer today has made abundantly clear that climate change is, is, is exacerbating an already dire humanitarian situation, affecting the availability of critical resources for Yemenis, displacing them time and time again, and driving local level tensions and conflict. As we first approach the rainy season, we know that Yemenis, like Ms. Shakir, are once again fearing terrible flooding, like we have witnessed in, witnessed in recent years. Meanwhile, every drop of water is precious in Yemen, one of the world's most water-scarce countries. Regrettably, the absence of appropriate infrastructure means rainwater is not harvested for water supply. This is why the European Union is supporting sustainable initiatives on the ground to improve water access and humanitarian efforts which prioritize emergency preparedness and response. We call on the government of Yemen to ensure that its policies, including at the local level, are inclusive and sensitive to natural resource management and the many climate and water-related challenges the country is facing. President, in conclusion, we hope that the political will of all actors in Yemen and much needed de-escalation in the region, the momentum needed to once again move forward on the path to peace in Yemen can soon be restored restored. I thank you. I thank the representative of Slovenia and I give the floor to the representative of the Republic of Korea. Thank you, Madam President. To begin, I also would like to thank Special Envoy Grundberg 
Director Worston of Ocha, and Ms. Shakir, the founder of Itar Foundation for their briefings today. This uh, briefings helps inform our understanding of recent development in Yemen on the ground. Madam President, our efforts to advance a political solution in Yemen have slowed since last October, despite the Special Envoy's continuous endeavors for political settlement in Yemen. The situation on the Red Sea impacts our endeavors to achieve peace in Yemen and is intensively affected by the recent elevated tensions in the broader region. Escalation in a broader region is very acute at this moment. Regrettably, the Houthis are aggravating the tension further beyond the Red Sea. We recall that the Special Envoy urged a reset on the calculation on the Yemeni questions. But again, regrettably, there has been no major change in Yemen over the last month. While progress has stalled, as Briefer said, civilians continue to suffer due to ongoing security and an economic crisis, in addition to environmental issues recently. My delegation reiterates its consistent commitment for the support for the UN Special Envoy and notes the vital importance of full implementation of Resolution 2722 by all member states. To assist our overall efforts, the Sanctions Committee on Yemen will keep closely monitoring the sanctions regime. In particular, the arms embargo under Resolution 2216 with the support and the cooperation of the panel of experts on Yemen. Madam President, beside the political and security situation in Yemen, we must also take note of the deteriorating humanitarian situation in Yemen. The overall picture remains deeply concerning, given that humanitarian agencies are short of funds. Malnutrition figures remain high, in particular for children under age two. Food insecurity and lack of nutrition jeopardize the survival of vulnerable groups in the country, especially in Houthi controlled area. I also listened very seriously on the briefings of the cholera outbreak in Yemen. In this regard, my delegation has high expectations for the WFP pilot exercise to provide relief to the hardships the Yemeni people are facing, which would be estimated to aggravate until August. Madam President, economic issues are inherently interconnected with the security issues, as the Houthis have attempted to deter the government's oil production, which has in turn worsened the government's financial capacity to pay civil servants. With contradictory economic policies by both sides, the viability of the economy itself is being negatively impacted. As such, we need to advance solutions to resolve this. Madam President, we have noted environmental issues currently ensuing in Yemen, including Ruby Mar case in March on the Red Sea. The briefing from the civil society today also helped us understand the imminent emissions we should take in Yemen. Environmental issues cannot be lessened by excluding key civil society stakeholders and also in needs cooperation from the international community. We commend the UN in dispatching its experts of examining the sunken Ruby Mar. Member states in the UN should maintain sharp focus on the environmental issues issuing in Yemen continuously. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the Republic of Korea. And I give the floor to the representative of the United States. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And thank you, Special Envoy Grunberg and OCHA Director Wosonu uh, and Ms. Shakir uh, for your briefings. I also welcome the permanent representative of Yemen to this meeting. At the outset, I would like to congratulate His Excellency Sheikh Mohsen Al-Zindani on his appointment as Yemen's foreign minister. We welcome his commitment to Yemen's unity and to reviving a UN-led Yemeni-Yemeni political process that consults civil society and is aimed at bringing the Yemen conflict to an end. The Houthis' reckless attacks in the Red Sea and the worsening situation for the Yemeni people 
caused by Houthi actions continue to be alarming and undermine the prospects for peace in Yemen. U.S. Special Envoy for Yemen, Lender King, traveled to Saudi Arabia and Oman earlier this month to continue the United States' intensive diplomatic efforts to halt the attacks in the Red Sea. In addition to the impacts on global shipping, these continued Houthi attacks also impede the delivery of humanitarian assistance to 11.2 million Yemenis and to people in dire need in other countries. Tightening supplies and skyrocketing freight and insurance prices translate directly into rising costs for the Yemeni people. In carrying out these attacks, the Houthis are trying to distract attention from their many failures in human rights abuses, putting their own interests ahead of those of average Yemenis. In addition to the attacks in the Red Sea, attacks on Yemenis are continuing. The Houthis continue to lay siege to the city of Taiz, restricting water access and repeatedly firing sniper rounds into the city, killing and injuring children. We were disturbed by clashes last month in the capital after Houthi forces reportedly forced worshipers at a mosque to listen to their televised propaganda instead of traditional prayers. We were also disturbed by reports that the so-called Houthi courts sentenced nine people to death earlier this year on dubious charges of sodomy with punishments including crucifixion and stoning. The group's ongoing cruel detention of members of vulnerable religious minority communities is unacceptable. Colleagues, the grim reality is that the Houthis are not only willing to condemn millions of men, women, and children in Yemen to hunger to advance their Iran-backed agenda, but they are also willing to use violence and terror for control. We must continue our efforts to demand the Houthis cease their attacks consistent with Resolution 2722. We must also do more to underscore the Council's concern regarding the Iranian origin of weapons used by the Houthis and the ongoing violations of the arms embargo. It is no secret that Iran provides weapons to the Houthis in violation of the UN arms embargo. And so we repeat our call for Iran to stop these illegal weapons transfers and to stop all activities that facilitate the Houthis' reckless attacks. Iran's continuous efforts to foment instability and terror in the region, as demonstrated through this weekend's unprecedented attacks by Iran against the State of Israel, need to be strongly condemned by this Council. Madam President, the United States reiterates its request that the Secretary General's monthly report submitted to the Council in accordance with Resolution 2722 include information regarding the types of weapons used in each incident and, where appropriate, the likely origin of these weapons. Ongoing violations should not be tolerated. Member states should identify and designate violators for sanctions, and the Security Council should strengthen existing mechanisms and authorities to address escalating violence in the Red Sea. We look forward to continued discussions about the ways to strengthen UNVIM's capacity to inspect vessels bound for Houthi-controlled ports to ensure compliance with the arms embargo and prevent the import of weapons. We also look forward to the Yemen Panel of Experts' upcoming report and hope to address their findings and recommendations in a future meeting. Despite these regional and domestic challenges, we continue to believe that negotiations toward an inclusive Yemeni-Yemeni peace process under UN auspices ultimately remain the best path to stability, one that we hope could lead to a durable end to the conflict while addressing Yemeni calls for justice, accountability, and redress for human rights abuses and violations. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the United States. I now give the floor to the representative of Switzerland. Merci, Madam la President. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to thank Special Envoy Hans Grunberg and OCHA Director of Operations and Advocacy, Edem Basornu, for their briefings. And I also wish to welcome Madam Varmid Shakir and uh, to applaud her resolute commitment to the Yemeni people. Madam President, on the 26th of March last, some 60 civil society organizations reminded us uh, through a statement that four out of five Yemenis are currently experiencing poverty. This is a situation experienced by Antisar Kara, a 35-year-old woman from Al-Sawad, 
in the governorate of Damar. Despite the many obstacles in her daily life, Antisar assures us that she will, and I quote, never stop striving for a better life. Echoing these optimistic words, Switzerland wishes to highlight the following points. Firstly, we call for the preservation of gains made in the peace talks in Yemen. We reaffirm the importance of these talks being brought to a rapid and concrete fruition. The parties must refrain from any actions that could jeopardize the implementation of the roadmap including financial measures affecting the country's economic health. In this regard, we, re we reaffirm the importance of the exercise of the rights and freedoms of navigation in the Red Sea. We condemn all attacks on merchant vessels. We call for the immediate release of the 25 crew members of the Galaxy Leader. The crimes recently perpetrated in Rada attest to the high price paid by civilians as a consequence of this conflict spiral. Furthermore, we wish to reiterate the appeal we made yesterday in this chamber, namely the spiraling escalation must stop immediately. All attacks must stop, both in the Red Sea and in Yemen. The region must not sink into an even broader and deadlier conflict at a time when we are facing a catastrophic humanitarian situation in Gaza. De-escalation must be the priority. Secondly, we note with concern that the humanitarian environment in Yemen is becoming ever more complex and dangerous. In this context, we welcome the commitment of UN and humanitarian personnel, including national and recruited locally recruited staff, and we recall that they are protected under IHL. As we have just heard from the High Representative of Ocha, the economic situation in Yemen is having grave repercussions on food security and malnutrition. We cannot stand idly by. Finally, we are concerned by the uptick in cholera cases. We reiterate the importance of investments in sanitation projects. Third, climate change is exacerbating the social and political vulnerabilities already afflicting Yemen. Natural disasters have displaced more than 700 thousand people since 2008, thereby increasing tensions around water, food, and basic services in host regions. A recent study by a Yemeni from a Yemeni NGO financed by Switzerland has shown that more than half of the people already displaced have had to change shelter because of natural disasters. In addition, stress factors such as droughts, and floods continue to intensify with climate change, and they are causing agricultural losses and exacerbating livelihood insecurity. Against this backdrop, we wish to highlight the critical role played by women in alleviating tensions linked to natural resources. The Council should support these efforts within the framework of its mandate and ensure smooth cooperation between the UN entities present in Yemen. Madam President, the picture that has been painted today should encourage us to redouble our efforts. The Yemeni people can count on the full support of Switzerland. Thank you. And of Switzerland, and I now give the floor to the representative of Ecuador. Gracias. Thank you, Madam President. I welcome the information provided by the briefers, and I welcome the permanent representative of Yemen to this meeting. Ecuador remains concerned about the impact which the escalation of hostilities in the Red Sea has on the humanitarian situation in Yemen, considered to be one of the largest global crises. As FAO warned in a recent report, if maritime transportation in the Red Sea continues to be disrupted, the food insecurity situation in Yemen, where 5 million people are already suffering from acute food insecurity, will continue to worsen. In addition to that, we have the impact of climate change and the impact of military operations, which could lead to the destruction of infrastructure, including ports and storage facilities. This will hamper the distribution and the storage of food. Madam President, the conflict in the Red Sea is not only, not only threatens to reverse the limited progress achieved in restoring the livelihoods of Yemenis, but it could also impact the will of the parties to pursue the peace process. While hostilities have remained at relatively low levels, in recent months, clashes and troop movements have been seen in various regions of the country. The parties also continue publicly to threaten a return to war. 
we cannot wait until an escalation of internal fighting happens. We must show that this council remains united in supporting the peace process, as well as in coordinating efforts to reduce tensions. For that reason, my country reiterates the need to implement Resolution 2722, whose fundamental pillar is the cessation of attacks against commercial vessels by Houthis. These attacks have no justification or legitimacy whatsoever. We must also safeguard progress achieved in reaching an agreement, laying the foundation for an end to the conflict, and we must continue to support the mediation efforts of Special Envoy Grunberg, who is facing growing challenges. My delegation supports the actions of the Special Envoy to maintain regional and international support for the implementation of the roadmap, as well as in keeping channels of communication open with all actors. In conclusion, Ecuador encourages UNMAS to continue to cooperate with UNMA and UNDP in locating and deactivating landmines and explosive remnants scattered throughout Yemen. These are a latent danger for the civilian population, particularly for women and children in rural areas. Thank you. And the representative of Ecuador, I now give the floor to the representative of Japan. Thank you, Madam President. We appreciate Special Envoy Grunberg and Director Vosornen for their informative briefings. Our appreciation also goes to Ms. Shakia for her briefing on especially the impacts on climate change in Yemen. Today, I wish to address three points. First, on the ongoing threats to maritime security by the Houthis, Japan welcomes the Security Council press statement issued last month in which the 15 council members spoke out in one voice that the Houthis' attacks on vessels are unacceptable. Unfortunately, however, the Houthis are continuing their dangerous military activities and disrupting the free and safe navigation on international shipping and global economy. Moreover, the Houthis are still detaining 25 innocent multinational crew members together with the Japanese-operated vessel Galaxy Leader. Nearly 150 days have passed since they have illegally seized by the Houthis. Once again, Japan strongly demands that the Houthis comply with this Council's repeated warnings, including in Resolution 2722, immediately cease their reckless conduct and release the Galaxy Leader and its crew. The Council members should remain united to tackle this challenge to our vitally important shipping lanes, a global problem affecting all of us. Madam President, second, the security situation in Yemen, Japan would like to reiterate its unwavering support to the work of the Special Envoy towards bringing lasting peace in Yemen. However, Japan regrets to see increased military campaign by the Houthis against the government of Yemen forces which recently led to exchange to fire that resulted many deaths and injuries. We are also concerned about the Houthis' hostile economic measures against the government of Yemen that are undermining a conducive environment for peace talks. We sincerely hope that the parties will engage constructively under the auspices of the United Nations. In this context, it is essential to secure the full, equal, safe, and meaningful participation of women in the peace process. Third, on the humanitarian front, Director Vosolnu reminded us that more must be done to save the people of Yemen from the multifaceted crisis, including malnutrition and the spread of epidemics. The already dire humanitarian situation is being amplified by climate change. Japan calls for the international community to increase assistance to alleviate the plight of Yemenis, particularly women and children. In this regard, we should continue to urge the Houthis to lift the restrictions on women's freedom of movement, which negatively impact women's daily lives and curtail the ability of female aid workers. To conclude, Japan calls on all parties to work towards peace and stability in Yemen and beyond. 
I thank you. I thank the representative of Japan, and I now give the floor to the representative of China. Madam President, I thank all the briefers for their briefings. At present, the situ situation in Yemen remains complex and daunting. All parties concerned should adhere to the general direction of political settlement, remove interference, move toward each other, and work together to promote a comprehensive political process that is Yemeni-led and Yemeni-owed. We urge all parties in Yemen to exercise restraint, avoid provoking an escalation of the situation, and to create a favorable atmosphere for the political process. China supports the efforts of Special Envoy Grunberg and expects all parties, in particular countries with influence on the situation in Yemen, to play a constructive role. China is concerned about tensions in the Red Sea and reiterates its call on the Houthis to respect the right of commercial vessels of all countries to navigate in the waters of the Red Sea in accordance with the international law and to cease immediately relevant attacks. We call on the parties concerned to exercise restraint and refrain from actions that might exacerbate tensions. China reiterates that the Security Council has never authorized any country to use force against Yemen and that no country should misinterpret or abuse international law and Security Council resolutions. Alleviating the humanitarian crisis in Yemen is a shared task of the international community. The conflict in Yemen has lasted for nine years, causing massive destruction of infrastructure, including hospitals and schools. More than four-fifths of the country's population living in poverty, and more than 4.5 million school-aged children unable to attend school. China calls on the international community to increase its investment in Yemen's humanitarian and development efforts and looks forward to the early resumption of assistance program by the WFP in northern Yemen. Madam President, the tensions in the Red Sea are a visible manifestation of the spillover effects of the Gaza conflict. Despite the adoption of the Security Council Resolution 2728, which explicitly demands a ceasefire, the fighting continued unabated through the end of Ramadan, and the threat to regional peace and stability continues to grow. Israel should fulfill in good faith its obligations as a member state of the UN and fully implement the demands of the Council resolutions by immediately ceasing its military attacks on Gaza and ceasing its collective punish punishment of the Palestinian people. China supports the Security Council in taking further action in light of the developments on the ground. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of China and I now give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Thank you, Madam President. We are thankful to Special Envoy, Mr. Hans Grunberg, as well as the OCHA Director of Operations and Advocacy, Madam Adam Vasurnu, for the report on the political and humanitarian situations in the country. We have taken note of the briefing from Madam Shakir. The Russian Federation continues to seek to persuade all stakeholders involved in the Yemeni paradigm to help facilitate the establishment in that country of a sustained ceasefire regime and the restoration of normal life. We extend our full support for the, uh, uh, for the efforts of Mr. Grunberg, efforts which are geared towards achievement of those goals and the eventual launch of a full-fledged, inclusive, nationwide dialogue under the aegis of the United Nations. Once again, we draw attention to the need for the renewal of the patently obsolete international legal basis for Yemeni settlement, which clearly no longer reflects realities on the ground. There is a need to urgently address also the deteriorating humanitarian situation in the country. Approximately 18 million Yemeni people need humanitarian assistance. That is nearly half of the country's population. We are receiving alarming reports about the outbreak of cholera. Cholera is a disease which can easily be treat, can be basically treated in the with the presence of basic medicines, and yet there is a catastrophic shortage of such medication in Yemen. We stress that Yemeni people, irrespective of where they reside, need to have unfettered access to food, medicines, and other necessities. We, have also, we are also alarmed by the situation in the waters surrounding Yemen. This includes the Red Sea. The Russian Federation has consistently advocated uh, for the safe and free navigation in those waters and region. We consistently condemn attacks on civilian vessels which pose threats to their crews and cargo, specifically the attack on the true confidence which uh, resulted in the deaths of crew members. We demand the immediate release of Galaxy leader, crew members, and the vessel itself. 
in our context with representatives of Ansar Allah, we reiterate our call for an immediate end to such actions and for attention to shift to the achievement of peace within Yemen itself. However, one must understand that the root cause of the situation is the ongoing bloodshed by Israel in the Gaza Strip in breach of Security Council Resolution 2728. This is a horrific escalation which claimed the lives of more than 33,000 peaceful Palestinians with grave repercussions throughout the entire Middle East, including repercussions in the Red Sea region. An end to the violence in the Palestine-Israel conflict zone is conflict zone is key to tranquility and calm in the Red Sea as well. We also note the destructive role of the self-proclaimed coalition helmed by the United States and the United Kingdom. They continue to carry out on a weekly basis attacks on Yemeni soil. The absence of results on the ground and their blatant inability to thwart the military capabilities of the Houthis is something which has not stopped Washington or London. Once again, we stress that missile and bomb attacks by the West Western US-led coalition targeting the sovereign territory of Yemen are categorically unacceptable. Also unacceptable are attempts to justify the aggression with resolution 2722 or to justify this with references to the right to self-defense under chapter under article 51 of the UN Charter. These are actions which undermine internal resolution in Yemen and thwart the efforts of international and regional mediators. In essence, largely uh, thanks as a consequence of this kind of a vicious cycle of escalation, Yemeni settlement has been forced to come to a pause. Furthermore, in the absence of a formal truce between the parties, the situation may further deteriorate. As Mr. Grunberg reported to us today, the clashes and hostilities among the Yemeni parties on the front line have become increasingly frequent. This is a dangerous trend which is liable to result in further escalation of tensions within the country. At the same time, we note that recently, clearly, having grasped the futility of opting for military action, the United States has become has begun increasingly expatiating on the need to de-escalate and for the need for actions and gestures of goodwill. This instills a certain degree of optimism. From the very beginning of the Yemeni conflict, Russia has consistently stressed the following. The way to resolve it is exclusively through political diplomatic means on the basis of the principle of inclusivity, which entails the participation of all Yemeni protagonists, including Ansar Allah. Madam President. It, is, it was with great uh, uh, regret that we learned that the U.S. has concluded the transfer of the weapons and munitions they seized in the Gulf of Oman, and they transferred them to the conflict zone in Ukraine. In this regard, we wish to recall the following. Any specific inspections regime to inspect vessels in international seas in the Yemeni context does not exist. And these kinds of actions are not provided for under resolution 2216, to which the U.S. refers. We condemn the broad interpretation of the provisions of specific Security Council resolutions on Yemen, including sanctions resolutions. We view the sanctions regime of the Council as a subsidiary regime, uh, a subsidiary mechanism for political settlement, not as a means for doling out punishment. These kinds of reckless actions show that Washington continues to strive to impose on the whole world its so-called rules-based order, where the rules are formulated and adapted to tailor their to be reflected to advance their needs by the United States and their allies. Nothing good for peace and security on our planet will come of such egotistical intractability and unwillingness to act in accordance with the norms of international law. Thank you for your attention. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation and I give the floor to the representative of France. Merci, madame. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to thank the briefers for their briefings. The region has seen a major development on the, from the 13th to the 14th in the evening with the unprecedented attack carried out by Iran and its proxies against Israel. France condemns this attack in the strongest terms. Obviously, it is a serious and major threat to international peace and security and to the stability and security of the region. France expresses its solidarity with the Israeli people and recalls its commitment to the security of Israel, of our partners, and regional stability. 
The SG's report bears out the fact that the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden continue despite the warnings of this count by this council. France firmly condemns the attacks carried out by the Houthis over the past several months. They infringe on the rights and freedoms of navigation, destabilize Yemen and the region, and adversely impact the interests of the countries of the region, as well as all of the countries benefiting from international trade transiting this zone. The impacts, the environmental and humanitarian impacts are disturbing. We remind Houthis to freely to release immediately the Galaxy Leader and its crew held since November 2023. We are also concerned about the information indicating that Houthis participated in the Iranian attack against Israel on the 13th. Given the irresponsible behavior of the Houthis, France will remain committed to the Aspides European operation to guarantee maritime safety and the freedom of navigation in accordance with international law and working with our partners. Resolution 2722 recalls the fact that the exercising the rights and freedoms of navigation must be respected and in accordance with international law, states must have the right to defend their vessels against attack. That resolution must be fully implemented. Madam President, on the security front, we must uh, transform this de facto truce into a complete and lasting cessation of hostilities to avoid any resumption of conflict on the ground. The humanitarian situation is catastrophic and has worsened in recent months. Insecurity in the Red Sea and in the Gulf of Aden has consequences on the cost of humanitarian operations and supplies, and funding is insufficient. It is also essential for the Houthis to cease destabilizing the Yemeni economy and causing an economic war against the government. Their irresponsible attitude has led to the impoverishment of the population. And the Fra France also condemns the issuance of counterfeit currency by the Houthis. And we support the Central Bank of Yemen based in Aden in its mission to guarantee the stability of the country's financial sector. Together, we must stand ready to meet the needs of the civilians in Yemen. Food insecurity impacts 70% of children under the age of two. The very development is at stake. And we're also concerned about the cholera epidemic spreading throughout the country. To address this situation, we must guarantee all necessary access and humanitarian workers must be able to carry out their missions without hindrance, in particular, female staff in Houthi regions. Moreover, we express our concern at the increase in arrests and abuses committed by Houthis against the population. We've seen images of the brutal destruction of homes in Rada last month, which led to the death of an, several inhabitants, including women and children. France supports UN mechanisms for greater stability and security in Yemen, uh, like uh, UNVIM, which is contributing to combating we weapons trafficking in the Red Sea. Thanks to the inspections UNVIM carries out, it has created trust and facilitates commercial imports and the provision of humanitarian aid to Yemen. It must be bolstered and better financed. We must also, through concrete action, support the efforts, uh, the governments of Yemen's efforts for reform and give it all the means necessary to restore its sovereignty over the country once again. France reiterates its full support for the Special Envoy and his efforts to define and implement an inclusive political roadmap. We call upon the Houthis to cease their attacks and to choose the peace process under the auspices of the Special Envoy. France welcomes the efforts in this regard of Saudi Arabia and Oman, as well as other regional stakeholders. The effective participation of Yemeni women in the political negotiations must be guaranteed. France will continue its efforts in this regard. Thank you. I thank the representative of France. I will now make a statement in my national capacity. I thank Special Envoy Grumberg and OSHA Director Vosurno for their comprehensive briefings and Ms. Shaki for her strong testimony today. The nine-year conflict in Yemen has created dire humanitarian conditions for Yemeni civilians. More than 17.5 million people face acute food insecurity, with numbers likely to increase in the coming months. Earlier, we were reminded how important it is for the international community to scale up support to the humanitarian response plan, this at a time when this plan remains drastically underfunded. The essential delivery of humanitarian aid continues to be hampered due to humanitarian access impediments. Authorities must lift restrictions on women's freedom of movement. 
These restrictions exacerbate gender inequality and structural barriers, hindering access to education, healthcare, and income for their families. We are concerned for increasing cases of cholera in Yemen and call for rapid, robust response by the international community. Malta is concerned that space for mediation efforts remain constrained due to escalations in the Red Sea and the region. We call on the Houthis to immediately cease all attacks and actions against commercial shipping and abide by their obligations under international law, including full adherence to Resolution 2722. Recent skirmishes in Yemen, including in Laj and Marib, also reflect the tenuous security situation. On the socio-economic front, the decision by the Houthis to issue new currency is concerning. Unilateral decisions that deepen the fragmentation of Yemen's already weakened economy only harms the well-being of Yemenis. We call on parties to de-escalate tensions and prioritize dialogue to find an agreement that will lead to sustainable peace. The establishment of a UN roadmap will be crucial to ensure the implementation of a nationwide ceasefire, an inclusive Yemeni-led and owned political process under UN auspices. Women must be full, equal and meaningful participants in all diplomatic efforts to find peace. And as has been highlighted again today by Ms. Shakir, we must not forget that Yemen is the third country most susceptible to climate-related impacts and one of the least prepared for climate shocks. According to a recent report by the UN Environmental Programme, environmental stresses such as water scarcity, desertification and extreme weather events are highly intertwined with security concerns. In 2023, over three quarters of newly displaced individuals experienced such displacement due to severe weather occurrences. While women in rural communities remain greatly dependent upon agricultural agriculture for their livelihoods, we also acknowledge their pivotal role in helping ease tensions over natural resources. Furthermore, through the work of women-led civil society organizations, they help meet the essential needs of communities in remote and frontline areas. The international community should support Yemen to mitigate the effects of the climate crisis. This includes ensuring adequate access to climate financing, assisting national preparatory systems and invest in climate resilient measures through effective strategies integrated with conflict prevention efforts. The Security Council needs to recognize this nexus to address the multiple impacts on communities and enhance long-term stability in Yemen. I thank you. I resume my function as President of the Council. I now give the floor to the representative of Yemen. <clears throat> Madam President, at the outset, I would like to congratulate you on presiding over the Council for this month. I wish you luck in your endeavors and I thank your predecessor, the representative of Japan, for their successful presidency during the past month. I would also like to thank Mr. Hans Gunberg and Ms. Adam Wosornu for their briefings and I thank Ms. Wamid Shakir for her briefing as well. Madam President, a just and permanent peace was and remains the main objective of the Presidential Leadership Council and the Yemeni government. Building peace in Yemen is a Yemeni regional and international imperative on our path to restore state institutions that would guarantee rights, liberties, justice, and equal citizenship that would make Yemen and the Yemeni people more safe and secure and strengthen their regional and international presence. Restoring state institutions is a main priority and the ultimate goal of any efforts to reach a political settlement without discrimination or exclusion. We need to build a brighter future for the Yemeni people. The Yemeni government once again expresses its openness and welcomes all initiatives and good offices to achieve a comprehensive and sustainable peace 
based on the national, regional, and international agreed upon terms of reference of the political settlement, namely the GCC initiative and its implementation mechanism, and the outcomes of the Comprehensive National Dialogue Conference, as well as Security Council resolutions, namely Resolution 2216, which represents a roadmap to address the Yemeni crisis. My government also reaffirms that it supports all regional and international efforts, as well as the efforts of the UN Special Envoy to put an end to this conflict and achieve peace in Yemen. The Yemeni government remains committed to the choice of peace, and we welcomed the truce announcement, and we also welcomed its extension and the widening of its humanitarian benefits to the Yemeni people in the areas under the control of the Houthi militias. We also welcome the number of measures and arrangements to build trust, which would lead to a proposed roadmap so that we can resume a comprehensive political process and a transitional period towards building peace and state institutions that are democratic and meet the aspirations of the Yemeni people. Despite these efforts of mediation from our brethren and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the Sultanate of Oman, however, although we were nearing the signature of a roadmap, the terrorist Houthi militias, as usual, decided to shirk their responsibilities towards peace they chose to undermine the political process with a destructive and dangerous escalation in the Red Sea under the pretense of assisting the Palestinian people in Gaza. However, time has shown the falsehood of these allegations. These militias destroying homes and, and killing their, their residents, these militias laying siege to cities looting property, terrorizing women and children, killing and kidnapping civilians. They, these militias could never support just causes. They have multiplied their restrictions and violations, as well as their military escalation at all fronts. Although there's a vulnerable truth, they were unable to honor their obligations because they can only live in a swamp of conflict. Their project is a project of war and destruction. They are not for peace. They cannot live in peace with society. History has shown this time and again. In this regard, I would like to commend the good offices of our brethren in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to address the Yemeni crisis, achieve peace, and alleviate the humanitarian suffering of the Yemeni people. The terrorist Houthi militias continue with their violations and grave crimes against the Yemeni people, the latest of which raising the homes of innocent civilians to the ground in the Rada city in Al Baida governorate, killing its, the residents of these homes. This crime resulted in the killing and injuring of around 35 civilians, mostly women and children. They have killed nine members of one household. This heinous crime took place during the holy month of Ramadan. This is not an isolated act. This is a part of a long series of brutal crimes committed by these Iranian-backed terrorist militias. This crime is a clear example of how these militias, although they claim that they support the Palestinian people in Gaza, but at the same time, on a daily basis, they perpetrate acts of terrorism, murder, and violations against the Yemeni people. They continue to impose an unjust siege on the city of Ta'ez. This has caused endless suffering and humanitarian crises for over 4 million people in this city. They have shirked their responsibilities when it comes to opening roads. They continue to adopt a policy of starvation and collective punishment. They also continue to target cities, villages, and residential areas, as well as the homes of citizens. They've used sniper fire to target 
innocent civilians, including women and children. They've perpetrated dozens of crimes. They've planted mines that claimed the lives of thousands of, men, of civilians. This in blatant violation of the calls of the international community and this council to put an end to this war, to resume the political process and alleviate the suffering of the Yemeni people. The Yemeni government condemns in the strongest terms the crimes of the terrorist Houthi militias. We reaffirm that these crimes have no statute of limitations. We remain committed to restoring state institutions, to imposing security, stability, and to end these terrorist practices against these steadfast Yemeni people. Madam President, the terrorist Houthi militias continue to target oil tankers and commercial vessels in the Red Sea. This shows the disregard of these militias to the environmental impact of any oil spill on the economic and agricultural sectors, the fish, the maritime environment, and biodiversity in Yemen and coastal countries. In this regard, we call on providing the necessary support in order to confront the potential negative impact of the drowning of the Rubimar vessel. We need concerted regional and international efforts to deal with these environmental challenges threatening Yemen and the region so that we can prevent any pollution that would directly threaten the maritime environment in the Red Sea. Houthi militias continue to escalate in the Red Sea so that they could shirk their responsibility towards peace to implement the agendas and plans of the Iranian regime in Yemen and the region to destabilize the region and the world. Once again, we warn against the flow of Iranian weapons to the terrorist Houthi militias in a blatant violation of Security Council resolutions, notably resolutions 2216 and 2140. This could lead to prolonging the conflict in Yemen and worsening of the humanitarian crisis. We have warned early on and on more than one occasion and before this council, as well as in the statements of His Excellency Dr. Rishad al alaymi the president of the Presidential Leadership Council before the General Assembly, we warned against these plans aimed at undermining security and stability in Yemen and the region and aimed at targeting the safety of international maritime shipping and the free flow of international trade. These attacks in the Red Sea are to implement these plans and they were going to occur whether or not there was a brutal Israeli aggression against the Gaza Strip. Madam President, the government of Yemen today is adopting the principles of transparency and accountability. We are implementing a number of economic and financial reforms in order to confront the economic and humanitarian challenges as a result of the Houthi militia's war and their, esc and their escalation and their targeting of vital oil facilities. They have also targeted oil export ports. This has prevented the Yemeni government from re-exporting oil for over a year and a half. This has prevented the Yemeni people from enjoying this important economic resource. This has impacted our state budget and prevented us from paying salaries. It has also increased pressure on uh, the exchange rate of our local currency and has resulted in a number of economic and humanitarian challenges. The Houthi militias are adopting a policy of starvation and they are launching a systemic economic war against the Yemeni people. We call once again on the international community to support us to confront these challenges and to find means to re-export oil so that we can honor our obligations under these difficult and exceptional conditions. We look forward to the support of the international community to confront these economic and humanitarian challenges to alleviate the suffering of the Yemeni people. We thank our brethren from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates for their support, which greatly contributed to confronting the deficit in our state budget and in overcoming a number of financial difficulties. 
as part of their economic war against the Yemeni people, the Houthi militias escalated once again against the Yemeni government and the Yemeni people. They have issued a forged currency and imposed its use in instead of the official currency in areas under its control in a blatant violation of all financial and banking laws and norms. We warn against the impact of this irresponsible escalation, for this would lead to confusion and complexion in transactions with citizens and financial institutions inside and outside of Yemen. This would also lead to further, further division in our Yemeni economy. It will undermine the safety of our banking sector and it will not serve the cause of peace. My country renews its commitment to cooperating and advancing our partnership and coordination with all UN and relief agencies operating in Yemen. It is important for UN agencies to move their headquarters to the temporary capital of Aden so that they do not remain under the extortion and terrorism of Houthi militias and so that they could reach all Yemeni areas without any discrimination. Once again, we reaffirm the need to send humanitarian support funds to the Yemeni Central Bank. This step will contribute to national economy recovery efforts and preserve the value of our currency and improve the living conditions of our citizens. Madam President, we have painted a grim picture of the current humanitarian situation in Yemen. We need more support from the international community to alleviate the suffering of the Yemeni people. In this regard, we look forward to the donor conference in order to mobilize funds for the humanitarian response plan in Yemen for 2024. And we call on sisterly and brotherly countries and international organizations to donate generously to support this plan at scale to meet the current humanitarian needs. We call on the United Nations and the international community to keep the humanitarian situation in Yemen at the top of their list of priorities as humanitarian crises around the world multiply. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representatives of Yemen for their statements. There are no more names inscribed on the list of speakers. I now invite council members to informal consultations to continue our discussion on the subject. The meeting is adjourned.